Uh, yes, my name is Teresa Nemeshani. I think what we do is startups in New York. So happy to be a partner of Grand Central Tech. Um, love all the work that they're doing. And um, what better way to spend a day than with a bunch of entrepreneurs? Um, I spent much of my time um, actually working with a subset of startups that we think are going to break, um, looking for partnership opportunities. And for me, what that means is you know revenue deals and distribution deals that can turn you from a small company into a big company. Um, so I'm so delighted to um, be here with our panel. Um, and what we're going to do is this. It's the end of the day. I'm personally a believer <laughs> that if someone doesn't throw a chair or burn their bra, then we're not doing enough. So <laughs> we want to really have an interactive conversation um, the next 30 minutes. And then we're going to actually turn it over to the tables um, to invite you to, to speak on something really specific, which is find out how you can help each other in, in finding deals. So without further ado, I'm going to actually sit down and um, start asking questions, OK? And we're going to do it in kind of a life cycle sort of way. Um, I feel like this podium is in the, in the way here. What should we do this one? Let's do it. We're sponsors. Do <laughs> that. Um, so oh, awesome. Um, so I want to kind of start at the beginning. When, when a startup is young, and we have um, some fantastic um, former entrepreneurs and current entrepreneurs here, um, one thing I see is that getting that first deal is really, really hard. When you don't have something to reference, you're cracking that nut. So I would love to ask Daniela to share with us um, the journey of their first deal at Bobble Bar. Like, how did you make that happen? Tell us about it. Yes. Oh. Um, so it's hard to know, it's hard to say exactly what one of our absolute first deals was because we worked in so many different ways with, with different companies, but one of the earliest ones that was really, really large and impactful for us um, was a long-standing partnership we had with DK and Wine. Um, we did a lot of work with them in the very, very early days when we were, you know, sub, sub one year old to begin. Um, and it started out very, very organically where you know, they had heard of our brand, we of course knew really loved their brand, and we pinged them on social media, and they pinged us back, and we kind of started a little bit of a conversation and loved us there. Um, we ended up being introduced through a mutual friend to someone on their marketing team, and started having just really, really, really natural conversations. So the first place it led was, you know, they were doing events, which many brands do, in their retail locations at a lot of their wholesale accounts. So they were doing events at Nordstrom's across the country where they wanted to infuse some fun element. Um, so we essentially, after talking to them, ended up hand-making bracelets for customers at these events. I personally um, flew to Nordstrom's across the country and like hand-strung bracelets for DPNY shoppers. Um, because that's what it takes and that's what you have to do when your team's 15 people and this is, you know, you're on the cusp of doing something really exciting. Um, that obviously led to a stronger relationship and then a few months later we ended up doing um, a co-branded collection with them, which was just so extremely exciting for us. We designed a collection um, essentially to accessorize their spring line of that year. It was sold in DKNY stores. It was sold on our website online, we did a full editorial with them, and it was just one of those really cool, really exciting moments for us as, a, as an incredibly young brand. I could, if I could ask a follow, oh wait, I'm late. Okay. Um, how do you know, like, when is enough time to put in and when is not? I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're in a race against the clock, right? And these deals can be total time sucks. Like, when, and and you, you started this DKNY journey without knowing what the deal was going to be. Were you 100% like certain along the way, or did you ever doubt it? I mean, you definitely doubt it. Um, I think that, first of all, I think when you're young, A, you don't have a lot of opportunities, so you're kind of just chasing whatever comes your way. I think once you start to get into that middle scale where more people are familiar with your brand and know your brand, then you start getting lots of opportunities. That's where you potentially get into what we most people call the shiny penny syndrome, which is you literally want to pick up every shiny penny that you spot, and you need to remind yourself, ROI positive, focus on the good stuff, like weed out the stuff that won't work for you. Uh, but in the early days, it's literally like you're in a desert, you are searching for water, and you will drink what comes your way. And if it means I have to go to every Nordstrom in, across the country and thread bracelets for people, like I will do that. 
Um, so, but I do think that there are a few kind of quick early indicators. So I think always look at who's in the room. Um, if it's a lot of junior folks, no offense, it's just you've got a lot more checkpoints to go to before it gets approval, especially if you're working with a much bigger company. I mean, back then we were 20 people, so someone on my team who might have a junior title, it doesn't matter. They literally sit two feet from me in a giant room where we yell ideas at each other, and they might turn to me and say, hey, should we do this? And I'll say, sure. It's very different when you're working with a Fortune 500 company, it, it has to go through that hierarchy and all of those levels of approval. So I would say if your initial conversations are with somebody who's who's pretty high up and, and really does have the gravitas to make things happen, you're in, you're in pretty good shape. Um, and look to see if there's natural excitement about your product and your brand and, and what you do. If those basic elements of the formula are there, then I think it's really just a matter about figuring out what you know KPIs they're trying to meet, what KPIs you're trying to meet, and how you put together a program that accomplishes both. Now, Rachel, you've been on the other side of the table uh, to Daniela. And you see a lot literally. Of, literally. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and so you see a lot of entrepreneurs that have not done a deal before or they're like really early. And you have to separate the meat from the chat. Like tell us what's on your mind. I mean, you know, we my, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because we look at a lot of early stage companies and I really look very much like I'm looking at like a seed or angel investment. Like I'm looking at a team. I'm looking at a vision. Like I tend, I remember working with you guys really early. I remember working with Birchbox really early. Katya just kept calling me on the phone. And I didn't know about Birchbox and I didn't know who she was and she just wanted to put a rental product in her box. But there was a tenacity and a vision there that really shined through. And I'll tell you a little secret about what, what, what has happened in my world is that, you know, my title now keeps changing. And my job is like VP of uh, Digital Innovation and Entrepreneurship, where I'm working exclusively. And so what's interesting is Fortune 500 companies are now starting to hire people, but the, this is their exclusive job. And I, I, I urge you to seek them out because there's people there now at Fortune 500 companies who are now dedicated to helping look and, and talk about your KPIs and work with unproven ideas and sometimes have a separate budget just to test and experiment so it can be a win-win for both. But you have to have a vision, you have to have nasty, but the thing I also always tell entrepreneurs is to have patience because it's not a big quick win with the Fortune 500. You have to have a little bit of patience as well. But I, I would highlight having pitched a lot of um, startup ideas to some of the bigger companies. Not a great company has a Rachel. I think that's an increasing yeah. trend. It's a new trend. And, and one of the things that's really challenging is if you're dealing with someone who's in a more conventional, for example, marketing or media role, they are trying to take your big idea, your vision, your creativity, <laughs> and sometimes it gets reduced to like, okay, how much am I spending? What's the CPM? You know, or, and you know, what's the ROI I'm going to get on this? And you're like, I don't know, scale as a startup to bring, you know, the ROI you're talking about. Either you embrace the idea or not. So I think you either have to find a Rachel, you can find a way to position that idea in really creative ways to get attention. Otherwise, you can waste a lot of cycles trying to make numbers work that just are never going to work because you're not yet at scale and only some people know what to do with that moment. And, and I, can I say one more thing too, and I don't know if you guys do, but we also like, you know, in my job, it's like an entrepreneurial job and it's kind of lonely. And, and I do have friends outside of L'Oreal who are working <laughs> in other industries who have similar jobs. And I will tell you, we talk about the startups we need. We talk about, I have a buddy at Coca-Cola, I'll see something that's not right for L'Oreal, but I will call him and say, you need to meet this, you need to meet this, well, you need to meet this company. Yeah, I think you made a really good point though about being patient, because I think there's often a mismatch between someone coming in and meeting with a big company, feeling they had a great meeting, and thinking the contract is right around the corner. And then it's like the NDA, the legal team, uh, most of you are saying techno tell technology to me, so let our engineering team kick the tires of your product. And so I think knowing that it's kind of a long distance one, and you have to keep, somebody who was up here before talked about confidence, I do think that's very important, but trying to figure out, is this a winner for you or not, and how long it's going to take and have multiple irons in the fire, I think is really important, but because it may feel like you had a great business meeting, or back to be your salesperson, had a great meeting with a business person, but if you're selling a technology product, sooner or later it's engineer to engineer is what's going to make that thing come inside a large enterprise. Which is why I also think, just one follow up on that is, I think you have to choose your moment carefully as to when it's right for you to partner with a big brand. 
if your focus at a particular moment is building your product or scaling your audience and adoption, it may be really alluring to get that quick win with a brand, but it is an investment to, to the, all the points that are made. And sometimes that's the right moment, because it's that right PR breakthrough or access to a new audience that might completely transform your opportunity. Or other times, it might be a complete distraction because what you really need to be doing is coding um, or focusing on quick uh, you know, audience development or uh, consumer acquisition strategy. So I think choosing that moment for the first few deals is really important because there's an opportunity. A big enterprise is going to ask a lot of questions about security, you know, encryption, scale. They're going to want you to be flexible and understand what's going to be differentiating for that company with your product. And they may, to your point, lead you in a direction you really might not be ready to go in. And you're trying to please that one niche customer when you really need to find your feet a little bit more with your product first. It can be tricky. I, I think the security thing is actually something that is really important before you start talking to brands because it comes up again and again and again. And there's nothing that gets things stuck in the pipeline more than having a security conversation when you're not ready. One thing um, I've, I've seen less experienced entrepreneurs kind of miss and the, um, the more experienced entrepreneurs you know, get um, is sort of a discovery process among the larger companies where they're, they're sort of separating out who they're gonna prioritize. Um, one of the very common questions is, like, what's your fiscal calendar? You know, like, when are, are there any really important deadlines coming up? You know, sometimes you've got people who are going to get to green or hit their, hit their, you know, goals and otherwise get their bonus because your project <laughs> happens or not. Then, like, momentum happens and resources can get thrown on it. You know, and other times you might have what seems to be a super positive meeting, but if there's no momentum kind of organizationally around it, you might be, you know, in dead city. Um, I, I just see often it really kind of can separate the more experienced from less experienced entrepreneurs. These are completely legitimate questions to to ask. Now, I wanted to ask uh, Caroline. You mentioned when we were talking, um, particularly I think in enterprise deals, but maybe not just, maybe with the brands as well. Um, often that decision making is very distributed. You know, you've got business decision makers, but technology decision makers as well, how does an entrepreneur with very limited time figure that out and like plan for it? Yeah, I think what often happens is someone will get in the door with a product by contacting someone in the business director or getting a connection to the business, and that's very important. There's nothing wrong with that. And then you go to the meeting and that's the person you kind of want to be selling to. But then there'll be a lot of engineers there who are, going, are there to see, you know, how good is this product? And you can't just dismiss them and keep talking to the business person. You want the business person to understand, this is my value proposition, this is what we have, even as you're trying to answer the questions, which even if they're well meant, can, can feel kind of hostile. You know, like, well, do you have this, do you have that? We have something that does this. And, and, and navigating that so that you're actually connecting as a person, if you have a tech product, with other tech people and showing that you understand why they're asking those questions and that you're eager to work with them. At the same time, you keep your focus on that business proposition with the person in the business. It can be very tricky, but that's what you have to do. When someone tries to do an end run around technology, it doesn't really work. And sooner or later, it comes back to that group. So trying to develop those relationships and treat them equal, as equally powerful decision making will really help you. Well, Janet, you, I mean, your, your experience is so far ranging. You've, you've touched and created so many deals, you know, both on behalf of Huffington Post and then also inside of Betaworks. What are the lessons that, that you know, if you're mentoring someone, what do you, what do you recommend? So, so the first lesson we've covered, which is just to choose the moment carefully, which is yeah. what's the right time to make a deal, because it is a major investment. The other thing is that it's not about what you think you have to offer. It is very important to have that clear value proposition. But I think it's less about what you want to sell, and more about what the person on the other side of the table wants to buy, or the problem they're trying to solve. And the two are not always, one does not always lead to the other. So really taking the time to understand if you're going to get that one big need, you've networked your way to that conversation. Whether you're a huge media company or you're a tiny startup, the principles are the same, which is it's gotta add value to their world. It's gotta be worth it for them to orchestrate all those technology people and all the other business stakeholders that might need to weigh in on the decision. And 
So really listening um, as opposed to pitching becomes really important. So what are the questions you need to ask as opposed to I need to really quickly get through every single slide in my deck and make sure that I have gone from A to Z and told the entire story of my journey. Because frankly, the journeys that, every, that entrepreneurs have been on, as amazing as they are, they are great stories. It's important to capture a little bit of that creative uh, inspiration. That's sort of a short part of the story. The what's in it for the person on the other side of the table becomes the focal point very quickly. So you can tell that story, but telling it in a way that's relevant to the potential buyer, partner, business developer person, I think is an incredibly important skill no matter what scale company you're talking about. And especially on things that are in the never been done before category, like they have to really go out on a limb as a huge company and take a leap of faith that they believe in you, that you have integrity, that they trust that it's going to work, that it's going to work at scale, that it won't risk their brand. And so, um, you know, being really compelling from the beginning about the problem you're trying to solve, I think, still holds very true. How, how do you, I mean, those are, you know, those, those feel and sound like big complex, you know, deals. Um, does every deal out of the gate need to be so big and complex? I'd love to hear about pilots, how you design one, how you de-risk something so so that it actually happens. Well, I mean, I do think what Janet said is extremely important even in, in pilot days. I want to know from an, as an entrepreneur, even with an unproven idea, as you start to talk, three ways that you're going to help me improve my business. I want to have a thesis about three different ways you're going to help me drive my business, knowing what my challenges are. It's more important for me to understand that because if I'm sold and I like you and we believe in your company, what we become are your internal sales team. So to Jan's point, I'm talking to IT. I'm sitting in meetings with our CEO. Like I am an advocate for you, where my own professional reputation is in question. So you better be able to feed me those three things. They're one big thing of how you're gonna help me drive my business. Because just knowing your deck of what you what you do is not enough. And from a pilot phase, here's my pilot phase um, advice. Think about, this goes back to what you were saying before, it's like think of the case study that you want to build first. Who's the right vertical? Who's the right champion? Who, what is going to be the story you want to tell to get to the next phase? And go and be, and be tenacious and find the right partner in the company to be able to help you to do that because that case study is what's going to lead you to point B. Now, speaking of the case study, you said something to me really interesting earlier. Um, which was, so let's say, you know, you design a pilot, you think about the case study, and then you do it, right? Like you get, you get agreement, and, and, and you, so you run it, some things work as planned, some things don't work as planned, and then the pilot's over, and it's very easy when that happens for everyone to just sort of like, kind of go all the way to the wind and sort of go home. Tell me a little bit about, you know, wrap up, selling, you know, through the company after. You have some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, I've, that I'm struggling with in my day-to-day -day is working on pilots and having the companies that I work with package their own results. Um, I spend a lot of time packaging results. Even for later stage companies, you'd be surprised to hear who they are. But I want you to be able to help me do that because I am partly working for you, but I also have 30 other pilots I'm working on. So I want you know I want you to be your best own advocate. I want you to think about did we what, what is it that we originally talked about? Did we sell more products? Did we increase reach? Did we did we acquire a different kind of customer? I need the entrepreneur to help me do that rather than spending so much time doing that because that's where things slow down and it slows down for both parties and it does help up but it does put scale at risk. So at, at what stage does I mean, I assume for, for you know any startup that's you know quite early stage, it's the CEO that's having a meeting with you, and it's it's the the story and the emotion of the entrepreneur that that's really kind of you know driving it through, at least like providing that initial spark. But at some point, hopefully, you know that startup is growing and the entrepreneur has too much stuff on their plate. Like, at, when do they bring in a biz dev person, or do you, is the CEO at any time like not the right person to be doing this? Yeah, I mean, we usually start with at least two people in the room. So if we're pitching business or if it's a new business, you're going to have me and my co-founder, Amy, and I'm co-CEO. So we split these types of meetings. So you're getting one of the two of us, and then you're usually getting 
someone in his dev, or it could be for us someone in merchandising, because obviously a lot of our large relationships are with wholesale partners. Um, and once you are sort of past the pilot, getting up and running, like we've flushed everything through the system and now everything's sort of working like clockwork, then you really should be working directly with our VP of merchandising or you know, a head of his dev or some other senior person. You shouldn't really see me or Amy unless there's something you need to come in and fix or solve or, or some problem, but it should be pretty much on autopilot. Which, which is why I think it's so important to bring in whoever that person will be who's going to manage the mm -hmm. relationship with the partner from the very beginning. So they hear the promises that were made, they hear the inspiration of the CEO, but they're also there to really manage through the process. Because whether it's a tiny pilot or it's a huge execution, I think for big brands, it's got the same level of risk. Uh, because their brand is a lot more at stake. Uh, there's a lot of upside to the startup, and there's a lot of risk to the big brand. And by the way, that's why we should all do this. But doing it thoughtfully and managing through something will go wrong, being accessible and available to problem solve and troubleshoot, and make sure that you're really servicing that partnership, I think becomes incredibly important. So whoever it is that has that day-to-day -day responsibility has to know that the standards are sort of off the charts, because something will go wrong, and that's okay. Like that. that is really important end up in a situation where every time you reach out there's somebody different that you're speaking to you have to keep explaining where you are and what you're doing. That can be very difficult. And when they're growing, a, 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 a young firm is growing, often there is a lot of shifting in the ranks. So whatever continuity you can create can be very important for getting that over the line. Why do you think the ball's being dropped? Um, like, like, do you think it's the wrong people or the, your investors are telling you to move on to the next new deal? I think there's just a hunger to put a brand, a Fortune 500 company um, logo on the deck that sometimes the, the big picture is, is lost. And it becomes more like, we did a deal with L'Oreal, then actually thinking about how that scales throughout the company and the business that is lost. And I, I don't think it, it serves either party um, in a great way. So we're going to do a lightning round. You're completely unprepared for this question. <laughs> um, if maybe tough for you to answer in, in the role that you're in, but I, like if there's a deal that you could create, you know, right now, I, in, from your case, like with a startup, and in your case, with a big company. I'm not sure where to, where to put you. <laughs> um, you know, so you can retire. Retire. Right. <laughs> right. Um, like moment to kind of envision a future world, um, you know, why don't, you know, well, Rachel, you can start, like, what's, what's a deal you wish you, you'd like to see somebody come up to you and be like, let's do this? I can't disclose that publicly. Oh, that's fair enough. Damn. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, on a generic level, I think you're looking for unexpected juxtapositions of new kinds of interactions and experiences with consumers. and simple ideas like surprise and delight you know, really still matter. I mean, we've got all these new form factors and ways to touch uh, and, and create experience for, on behalf of consumers. And so, uh, you know, to, to me, it's tapping into that creativity and going into that new frontier. It's sort of a generic answer, but I think it's still true. You know what, I will, I, I will say this. I want to keep, you know, trying new ways to keep customers loyal to brands. And I think that that's a challenge um, that we face in our business and, and, and coming up with ways to keep the next generation of Gen Z loyal, profitable is um, a big to me. Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're always looking for partnerships that make sense within the, you know, sort of two, three growth verticals that we consider to be really critical um, to our growth, not necessarily for, for the next year, but I'd say two to three years down the road, because at this point, that's probably the, the discussions that we're having, right, 2016 at this point is pretty fully made. Um, so as we think about 2017 and 2018, the stuff that gets us excited, um, our international distribution opportunities, so if we think about our wholesale channels, that's one area that gets us excited. Um, and then we have some exciting um, opportunities in category expansion where we've seen some really strong success. So that's another area where we have the opportunity to take the bobble bar brand and, and stretch what that means a little bit. Yeah, I mean, actually, just because it's on my mind, I, surprisingly, you know, we have some issues with the enterprise project management. You think that that was completely covered. Uh, well, I actually think it's sort of a wide open area where nobody has really come up with something that we feel com comfortable and confident using. I mean, we're moving into doing our own, and if anybody had a really good one, I'd be interested to know. 
Is anyone in the room doing enterprise project management? No, oh, someone way back there. Okay. We will speak. You'll, you'll talk after. Um, actually, I'd like to kind of bring us in for a landing with one final question that I think is a little bit controversial. I see CEOs sort of struggling with it. Maybe, maybe some of you don't, but you know, if, if there's a meeting or something that, that you can take or something that you can spend your time on and it's either fundraising or biz dev for a big deal, right? Binary decision, what should you do? I, I think it depends where you are in your life cycle. So if you are actively fundraising, then go fundraise. If you are not actively fundraising and the need for funds isn't imminent, then I go with biz dev and offer you done both at the same time? Yes, but we're two people, so that makes it like um, I think they're both full-time jobs, and I think the other thing is knowing what the needs of the business are, knowing what your fundraising needs are, hopefully you're on a trajectory where you know if you're in fundraising mode or if you're in scaling mode. Um, but you know, even though it's not a you know rigorous strategic planning cycle with you know, lots of PowerPoint decks, it's you know it's a more agile process. I do think there's you know you know where you are at any given moment between scaling the business and trying to build those relationships with either audience or partners versus trying to raise the capital in front of business. I think it also depends on who your supporting team is. So if you have someone who's really strong, who's senior, who's doing his dev, then you can rely a lot more on that person. You cannot rely on another person to do your fundraising for you. You just simply can't. So that will always have to be your focus. And I think the quicker that if, if business development deals are going to be an important part of your strategy and growth, then you should have a strong senior person that you can bring to meetings, start the conversation warm, and then have them run with a lot of the day to day and a lot of the, you know, sort of pushing things past the finish line. All right, so um, we're gonna do something fun next to kind of pull us together at the end of what's been an awesome day. You see some people are not sitting at tables, but it's my understanding that, that these, oh, nope. Okay, so we should just put Okay. <laughs> you are not supposed to talk to each other. <laughs> but over drinks, you should. And what I would ask you to do is this. When you are talking together, put out an ask, something that you're looking for, make it concrete, make it real, and also offer up some superpower that you have. Um, there is so much in this room for you to share with each other, and I can't think of a better way to, the, to end the day than with um, people kind of helping each other be better. So, uh, without further ado, we are we're finished here, and I'll turn it back to Kara. Thank you.